From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp in the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandotte, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations present and past who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts towards decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Joining me in the studio are Mary Catherine Nagel and Heidi Niece Carver as we talk about telling Indigenous people's stories through theater and how to work past being overshadowed. They're joining us today as part of the In the Round series, which is sponsored by the School of Art, the Department of Theater and Film, and other units across BGSU's campus. Mary Catherine Nagel is an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation. She was the inaugural executive director of the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program. Nagel is one of the country's most produced Native playwrights, having written and produced 14 plays, including Sovereignty. She's also one of the leading lawyers in the United States advocating for tribal sovereignty. Heidi Niece Carver earned a Ph.D. in theater from Bowling Green State University. She's currently an assistant professor of theater in the Department of Theater and Film and has taught classes in multiple genres of theater. She's also published on the outdoor historical dramas put on by the Cherokee Heritage Center in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Thank you, Mary Catherine and Heidi, for joining me today. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you. I'd like to start with a little bit of background. So, Mary Catherine, where did you or how did you first get interested in theater and particularly in relation to issues of social justice and community activism? Wow. Well, um, gosh, I'm trying to think. I mean, I uh, was always interested as a a kid in telling stories. So, you know, I used to, to do theater camps and I auditioned for school plays Um, I used to, as like a four-year-old, I was very obsessed with Frosty the Snowman, and I used to reenact the scene where Frosty melts every day. Um, I I thought I was Karen, so, and if anyone doesn't know, she's the one who cries when Frosty dies. Um, So I've always loved storytelling and always wanted to be in plays and and things of that nature, and I guess I really saw myself as an actress (laughs) Um, until, you know, I got to college and it was very hard to get cast in the plays because there were so many people who were better than me. Um, and I wrote my first play in college, and that was a really, really incredible experience. It um, got produced by a student theater group on campus, and I think from that point on, I just I knew that I wanted to continue to write plays. I don't think I ever thought I would be able to work professionally as a playwright. I just knew that this was something I wanted to do, and I you know, quite honestly, didn't really think about theater as as a means of social change and justice, I would say, until I started working on violence against Native women and the Violence Against Women Act specifically, because, I mean, I think looking back now, all of my plays have some sort of very social justice political bent. But then again, I think plays by white straight men that try to perpetuate the hierarchy also have a political bent. It just happens to be, hey, let's keep the status quo in place. You know, so um, I think all plays are political. I think all works of art are political. I wrote plays because I felt like the community I was in at the time, um, those the stories I was writing were of the community. And it wasn't really until about 2013 when I was working on the Violence Against Women Act when I really strategically in my mind was like, okay, as a playwright, I'm going to write a play. And the purpose of this play is to get Congress to restore tribal jurisdiction. <laughs> you know, so it was, it was a very, it, it was a, from the get-go, it was a very political purpose. And I think that the success of that play, and of course that play was a part of a much larger movement, so it's not like my play is what changed the law, but it became um, sort of a rallying cry for a lot of people in the movement. Um, And I think it also provided healing because, again, this movement is made up of survivors. That process, I think, really opened my eyes to how theater 
is one of the most effective tools we have for creating social change. And that also really got me thinking about how performances like Red Face contribute to dehumanizing our people. It's like, wow, when, when we tell real stories, look at what can happen. What's happening when we tell all these fake stories that dehumanize us, right? And, and just really realizing the power of theater, um, for good or for bad, um, because it can be used for both. Heidi, what about for you? How, what was your relationship to theater and into your current role? Well, very similarly, I, as a kid, I was, I was very shy, but I loved like acting things out. Um, and so uh, you watched Frosty. I watched a show called Kids Incorporated. <laughs> and I, I, my dream was to be on Kids Incorporated. Um, but yeah, I, I loved performing. And uh, when I, I went to undergrad as an acting major, and um, I would say I got a few roles, but I was not as good <laughs> as a lot of the other students, um, very similarly. So I actually turned to directing, and I loved directing. Um, and then so now I, I do direct at the university, uh, and then also I'm a theater historian. Um, and when I was working on my dissertation, I thought about what was my first when I was choosing a topic, I thought, what was my first theater experience? And my first theater experience, theater going experience, I was about six years old. And my parents took me to the outdoor historical drama Blue Jacket in Xenia, Ohio. And it really imprinted on my mind. Um, I still have very vivid memories of specific scenes from that production. It seems that really rested on a lot of the stereotypes uh, that are very harmful for indigenous peoples to indigenous peoples. And so I decided, you know what? Nobody's really writing about representations of native histories in outdoor historical dramas. So that's what led me to that area of research. That area of research, those those productions are, are mainly um, created and, and still performed by white people. And so um, through that research and meeting some uh, Native theater makers, um, for instance, meeting Larissa Fastors, who was choreographing Unto These Hills at, this to- at that time, I started to say, well, I, I want to know more about what Native artists are doing and creating. And so that really turned me in a direction of looking at contemporary Native theater making and um, the types of plays and performances and stories that are being told in Native theater today. That relates to another question I was going to ask about who was particularly influential for you as a playwright. But maybe I want to turn that around to say in terms of indigenous creators, are there folks that you would like people to know more about that you think are doing really tremendous work? Um, Absolutely. I mean, you know, first and foremost, Larissa Fasthorse has numerous plays that are phenomenal, but she's about to be or is the first Native woman playwright to have a play on Broadway. So this is a very exciting moment for us in Native theater. So Larissa Fasthorse, and then there's so many, I'm not going to be able to name them all, but I'll just... And uh, you never want to say you're listing your favorites because then the person you forgot to say that day. But, yeah, I mean, look, we've got uh, right now, you know, Madeline Say It is going around the country on her tour of her one woman show where we belong. And it's amazing. Unfortunately, we're at the kind of end of the tour, but um, she's, she's going to be at the public soon. And then she'll be at um, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, I think, like next August, I believe. Delena Studi is a phenomenal actress and also a phenomenal playwright. And she has a one woman show um, called And So We Walked. And it's my personal favorite play that I've ever, ever seen in my whole life. I say that it, I'm, you know, I'm probably a little biased because she's Cherokee and it's a very Cherokee centric story. I mean, it's, it's, it's a Cherokee story. So it feels deeply personal to me. And, uh, but it's, it is, it's one of the best pieces of theater I've ever seen in my life. Uh, we have, you know, so many Native writers and, and playwrights who came before us. You know, I think of Bill Yellowrope, who uh, recently walked on. And I think of like Spider Woman Theater, who continues to produce amazing work. You know, and then I think of playwrights like Suzanne Schoen Harjo, who, you know, have plays and also have, you know, this whole history of doing incredible guerrilla theater in the streets in New York and D.C., you know, in the 60s and 70s and um, all of her work and how that kind of laid the groundwork. And, you know, people know about Joy Harjo because she was the first, you know, um, Native 
U.S. Poet Laureate. She's also a playwright, and she has an incredible play that I don't know if it's public information yet, but um, I'll just say there's going to be an announcement soon that it's going to have a really awesome staged reading at a theater in the Northeast um, that's going to be sort of workshopped with, in partnership with one of America's most famous playwrights. And so I, I don't know if I can say it yet because I don't know. I don't, maybe it's already been announced that I'm just an idiot and I haven't seen it. But just look, up, just be on the lookout for Joy Harjo and a special reading coming up soon um, with a theater in the Northeast. Um, and, you know, then we've got um, sort of younger playwrights that are like just really making their mark, like Tara Moses, who's absolutely incredible. Um, Maddie Easley is a Wyandotte playwright. So since we're on the Wyandotte's ancestral territory, I think it's good to familiarize ourselves with some some you know, playwrights of, of, of those tribal nations. And um, I was going to say Ty Defoe. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, is uh, an amazing artist. Um, and Native Voices at the Autry, which is a theater company in Los Angeles. Um, oh, I should mention Vera Bedard, mm -hmm. um, who is an incredible playwright. She's Clinkett from Alaska and uh, does a lot of work with Perseverance Theater and many other theaters as well. But yeah, Native Voices at the Autry is an important place to look. They work with countless Native playwrights, and you can read about their work. Um, you know, and then they have like a whole – like they have a whole – you know, what do we call it, repository or archive of Native plays. And so you can reach out to them and say, we'd really like to read some Native plays, and they can, they'll share them with you. Mary Catherine, one of your plays is called Sovereignty, and the concept of sovereignty is a really crucial one. Could you explain for our listeners sort of what that term means to you and how it refers both to the world of legal rights, but also these ideas of cultural representation? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, sovereignty is a very important concept. Our tribes had sovereignty before the United States existed. And wherever our tribes are today, so for instance, you know, Cherokee Nation, we were historically in what is now known as Georgia, southeastern Tennessee, western North and South Carolina. Our sovereignty predates Oklahoma, predates Georgia, predates Tennessee, predates all of it, right? And if you ask different indigenous people, they're going to say, you know, someone might say, well, sovereignty is when I speak my language or sovereignty is when, you know, we grow the wild rice that our ancestors have grown here for time, you know, since time immemorial. Or, um, you know, if you're Muskogee Creek, you might say sovereignty is when I participate, in, you know, in ceremony at the Chukotlaco, which is the stomp dance. And, you know, ev sovereignty can mean so many different things. But it is the inherent right to self-govern, and an inherent in that right is to be who we are. Because part of the way the United States tried to eliminate tribal sovereignty was to erase who we are as indigenous people. That was why we had boarding schools where kids were beaten almost to death and sometimes to death if they spoke their indigenous language. That's why we've, you know, so many of the United States policies have been geared towards assimilation because the idea was if you erase culture, then you can erase tribal sovereignty. And then if, with no sovereignty, you have no tribal nations. And without tribal nations, you have no Native Americans, right? And the goal was we don't want Native Americans. So sovereignty is, is so critical. And if you think about it, you know, states have sovereignty. The United States has sovereignty. The United States wouldn't have sovereignty if it wasn't for tribal nations. When the United States became the United States, t to every other nation in the world, that was a joke. They were this crazy, stubborn teenager that had rebelled against its parent. And I think a lot of people were like, okay, yeah, right, you know? But one of the, George Washington, one of the very first things he did to signal to the rest of the world, hey, we're a legitimate nation, was to say, we're signing treaties with tribal nations. Just like you, France, just like you, Great Britain, just like you, Spain, we're doing it too. And they went and the very first treaty they signed was with the Delaware Lenape Nation. Then they turned around and after they ratified the new U.S. Constitution in 18, sorry, 1790, they signed the Treaty of New York with the Muscogee Creek Nation and then on and on and on and on and on. And that was how they said to the rest of the world, we have sovereignty. We're engaging in the sovereign act of signing treaties with another sovereign. And so the irony is that the United States used our sovereignty to legitimize the sovereignty of the United States, and now they seek to destroy it. So what does that mean for us today? It's, you know, fighting to preserve tribal sovereignty is, is how we fight to deal with violence against Native women, because if our nations can't protect our women in our own homes or our children in our own homes, then our people become the most vulnerable in the United States. And that's why we're the most vulnerable. So, you know, this connection between sovereignty and safety and culture 
it's they're all they're all connected and i think that's why when the united states wanted to eliminate tribal nations they attacked our culture and our women as a means to eliminating tribal sovereignty and i think that what you are speaking about also to tie it back to representation right in in entertainment and art and media i think a lot of times people don't understand why something is offensive. They don't understand why. And when I say people, a lot of times white people, right? We don't understand why a uh, red face is offensive. Like there's this knowledge, okay, it's offensive, but I'm not sure why. Or, okay, the Halloween costumes are offensive, but I'm not sure why. And it's, I think it's the missing link is the lack of knowledge of the material realities, right? So talking about hypersexualized costumes, Halloween costumes, not recognizing the dire situation of violence against women or murdered and missing indigenous women, right? Not, not recognizing or understanding the material realities of that, not understanding the way in which rape and assault against native women was used as a colonial tactic right, that that was a strategy by the U.S. government that then became civilian practice mm -hmm. in the 17 and 1800s, right? And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to credit Mary Catherine here. Mary Catherine and Sarah Deer have an amazing article about the return to Worcester that was published in the Harvard Journal of Gender and Law. And this is a piece in which you can really see Mary Catherine's strength as a storyteller, right? Because I'm not a lawyer, but I was able to read that article and understand it clear as day. And for me, that connected a lot of those dots. And then as a teacher, equipped me to be able to better explain to students, this is why these Halloween costumes are so, not just offensive, but dangerous, harm, physically harmful to Native women. Um, and so I highly recommend that article to everyone. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. It's a good article. <laughs> it is a good article. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas podcast. Question. Answer. Discussion. If you are passionate about Big Ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Hello, welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm talking to Mary Catherine Nagel and Heidi Nies Carver about Indigenous American theater and storytelling. Heidi, you co-authored a pictorial history of Piqua, Ohio, which traces the town from its origins in Shawnee, Delaware, and other Native American cultures to its position on the Miami Erie Canal, um, part of that 19th century history that we were uh, discussing. How did your training in theater shape your approach to that project? Yes. So I actually worked on that project. That was a project that I worked on with my husband, Michael Carver. And we wanted to do this pictorial history of my hometown, Piqua, Ohio. Piqua is actually a shortened version of a longer Shawnee term. And the Shawnee term comes from the, the phrase that Piqua refers to as he rose from, from the ashes. And so it comes from Shawnee stories in history. And so um, within this pictorial history, one of the things that, that we, we wanted to do was talk about the indigenous history. But being a pictorial history, it is really difficult to do that because what, what we have pictorially speaking are white produced works of Shawnee and Miami history from that area. So, so we wanted to try to, to talk about the limitations in that, in, a, in and of itself. Um, obviously, because it was a pictorial history, we had very little text to be able to do that. But I think that, you know, one, one thing about Piqua and growing up in Piqua, I think, very much shaped my, also my interest in, in uh, Native theater and Native drama. Piqua still has a, a quote-unquote Indian mascot. If you go to Piqua today, it's the Piqua Indians. The image of the mascot itself 
is actually uh, very much uh, a stereotypical plains construction, does not reflect what a culturally accurate depiction of um, Shawnee culture, right? And uh, to be honest, I'm not I'm not sure how many people in Pickwell would know when we say Pickwa Indians what tribes we're even specifically talking about when we're talking about that region. And so that has the the ways in which those kind of generalities and stereotyped images growing up in Piqua have shaped my thinking and also made me realize as I've become older, again, those gaps, right? Or just flat out misrepresentations and errors and how that affected the ways that I understood or thought I understood Native histories and cultures. I'm wondering if this is an opportunity to kind of call back to the role of storytelling for both of you and and theater as one form of storytelling. I I think the law is probably another form of storytelling as well. But how storytelling can work as a reparative practice for those absent, elided, uh, erased, and misrepresented histories. Could you speak a little bit to that, Mary Catherine? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anytime. So when Sovereignty was performed at Arena Stage, I would go every night. <laughs> um, and I would, no one knew what I looked like because, you know, I'm not on stage and my face isn't in the program. And so I would just go and sit sort of in the lobby when the show was over and listen to people come out. And I mean, everyone, like, I just, I wish I just recorded it because it just, without fail, every night people would walk out just aghast. They say, I can't believe I didn't know that. I can't believe. No one ever told me. And they, they would almost be like indignant, you know, like, how come no one ever told me? And I didn't, and no one told me this in history class. I never studied it. And I think that, um, so yes, when Native people get to write stories and they're performed on stage or on TV and film, we are filling in the gaps in America's failed educational system. And it's a system that's really failed us, but I think it's failed all Americans because these histories, yes, there there are histories, but they're also America's history. And I think that when we don't know our own history, we are doomed to repeat some of the worst mistakes of our past. And that's what we're doing today because we, we have purposeful amnesia. And so I think that Yes, I think that Native theater is a critical component of re-education, of educating over gaps, and of helping all Americans, you know, to learn what we shouldn't do again. And I think that no matter what your political beliefs are today, I think that's something that everyone can can agree on. I just uh, um, add on to that. So there is uh, an individual named Talon Silverhorn who uh, is employed by the state of Ohio, the state parks department. Um, And he is, so he's from Oklahoma. He's Shawnee. He is, uh, he's doing amazing work in the state of Ohio right now. And so I saw a talk that he gave about a month ago. And in this talk, he, he pointed out that these, these absences or these gaps in, in knowledge, right, these, these omissions um, in education and, and what we understand, we as a collective society understand about Native history and American history doesn't just hurt Native peoples. It hurts all of us. We've all missed out because we, we don't have a better grasp or a fuller story. Um, and so that's something, again, that uh, Talon shared and the audience that was there all very emphatically nodded. And that really just hit and resonated uh, with all of us. You've mentioned many um, wonderful playwrights and creators and other folks that our listeners could go out and seek out more work by. Um, But are there other things you would encourage listeners to do or to seek out in order to become more informed and more engaged in some of these issues? Sure. Um, (laughs) You know, there's so much. uh, Where to start? You know, I think that figure out who, what tribal nation uh, historically cared, you know, cared for the land that you now live on and make a connection with them. We're still here. So we may have been removed on a trail of tears, but we're still here. And so, you know, what uh, was just mentioned about Talon, you know, the Shawnee tribe still exists, right? And in fact, there's the Shawnee tribe, the Eastern Shawnee tribe, and the Absentee Shawnee tribe, all in Oklahoma. But 
all three of them are great. Reach out, talk to them, you know, familiarize yourself with them. The Lenape who came through Ohio as well on their trail of broken treaties have the Delaware Nation in Oklahoma as well as the Delaware Tribe. A lot of our tribes got broken up. We have the Cherokee Nation and the Eastern Band Cherokee and the United Katua Band, all three very legitimate, you know, Cherokee tribes that because of colonization and genocide got broken up into three different sovereign nations when we historically were one. So that's really important. I think, too, social media makes it easier than ever before in United States history to just inform yourself. And you can do that by following critical Native organizations that are doing critical work today. I, of course, am biased, but I think the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center is very important. They're they're on Twitter, on Instagram, and they're just NIWRC, like NIWRC.org or at NIWRC. Uh, I also think Illuminative does really great work. They're working to combat erasure of Native people, and you can find them on social media, just Illuminative. Um, there's the Native American Rights Fund. They're doing a lot of work to uh, on these legal issues, and every time there's a case in the Supreme Court, they have a tribal Supreme Court project, and I'm a part of that because I'm one of the attorneys that files amicus briefs in that project. But they're doing really important work to monitor every case that goes before the Supreme Court, and they'll report out on really critical cases that are happening. Like right now, we have a case that's going to be argued on November 9th, where um, there's a lot of industry interest in striking down the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, because there's a billion-dollar industry that wants more Indian babies to go to white families, um, because it's profitable. And so that's really alarming and problematic, and um, you know we could use everyone's support I think those organizations, and there's just so many more doing great work, but, you know, that way you can sort of see what 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 issues are happening today for, for Native people and get involved that way. Oh, and Native Voices at the Autry. I mean, and I will also say Madeline Sayet runs the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program at Yale, and it's a great way for younger Native artists, if you're a younger Native artist, to get involved. Um, they have different contests for young Native writers and actors, and they do really amazing work. I would add, oh, well, I want to I want to reinforce one point that Mary Catherine made, and that is in Ohio, there are no federally or state recognized tribes. That does not mean that there are not native peoples living here in Ohio. Also, it does not mean that Ohio is not homeland still to native people. So there are many federally and state recognized tribes that Ohio is still homeland. And so although there might be the perception of absence, it's just that. It's a perception. And also, Ohio has the highest rate of, quote, unquote, Indian mascots. And I don't think that I don't think that that is an accident, that there is a perceived absence and yet a prevalence of um, these very stereotyped images. And so, you know, for people who are listening in Ohio, if you are if you live in a town where there's there's a mascot, I encourage you to start thinking about that, right? And start talking about that. And what is that doing, right? Who does who does that serve and in what ways? And who does that harm in what ways? So that's one thing I would say. I would also uh, say if you have the means, you know, pay to support Native artists, right? And so if you are somewhere where there's a Native play, go see the Native play, right? Watch Prey on Hulu. Watch Reservation Dogs, right? Start watching and experiencing entertainment and art and talks and lectures that are created and given by Native individuals. Um, and I think at local and regional levels, at least here in Ohio, I've seen an increase in the number of, of panels that are happening um, that are gathering Native speakers. Go to one of those, right? And be open to learning and unlearning and relearning. I, I, I love that answer. Yes. <laughs> and because uh, I, I get asked this question a lot, and <clears throat> I always love to say, there's a theater in your community. Either it could be your student's high school theater, it could be the community theater, it could be the professional repertory theater, you know, in the big city near you. Have they ever produced a play by a Native playwright? Ever? Ask them. Probably they haven't. 
I bet you they have produced plays by Redface. Encourage them. And there are long lists we've given them on this podcast, right? There are probably hundreds of plays they could produce by Native writers. So just encourage them to produce their first Native play. That will make a huge difference. Thank you both so much for joining me today, Heidi and Mary Catherine. Listeners can keep up with ICS happenings by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU and on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. Our sound engineers for this episode were Damon Dotson and Jacqueline Swartz, with audio editing by Deanna McKeegan and Marco Mendoza. Research was provided by Sophia Mikalski with editing by Joe Alaya. Our musical intro was composed by Chris Caveira.